Well, hello, and I'm uh, greatly honoured and privileged to be speaking to you today. I wish it was in person. I would have liked to have seen your smiling faces, especially given your generosity and interest in uh, the importance of BigQuest in funding university-based uh, research. So my name is Michael Stovasser. I'm a professor of medicine. I'm director at the Endocrine Hypertension Research Centre at the Diamantina Institute at the University of Queensland. And I'm based at Greenslates and Princess Alexandra Hospitals. And I've been asked to talk to you today about some of our research, which is focused on curing hypertension and the very important role a special lady by the name of Mrs. Hunt has played in allowing us to achieve our research objectives. So the Endocrine Hypertension Research Centre was established in 1970 at Greenslates Hospital by Professor Richard Gordon. Uh, Prof Gordon is still alive and well, I'm happy to say, although he retired from university uh, quite a number of years ago now. I extended the centre to the Princess Alexandra Hospital in the year 2000. We are focused on research into causes, detection and treatment of all forms of hypertension, that's high blood pressure, with a special focus on hormonal or endocrine conditions that cause hypertension and can be cured or specifically treated. So who is Irene Hunt? Well, Irene Patricia Hunt was born in 1923 and finally died in 1998 while she was living at the Gold Coast. She was a long-standing patient of Professor Gordon and she left a generous endowed gift in her will to support hypertension research by Professor Gordon or his unit. The endowment was placed in perpetuity and its distribution is used to support medical graduates and scientists undertaking research usually while completing postgraduate degrees, almost all of them PhDs. And the support comes in the form of salaries, equipment, consumables, publication costs, and travel to conferences. The bequest also provides us with leverage for applications to other funding bodies, including the National Health and Medical Research Council. And since we received the bequest, we've been successful in obtaining no fewer than 30 grants worth about $6.8 million. And even when we're not successful, the bequest allows us room to, to move, time to breathe uh, with uh, ongoing funding until we are able to get another grant up. So what is hypertension or high blood pressure? Blood pressure is the pressure of blood in the walls of the arteries as the heart pumps it around the body. It naturally goes up and down all the time, adjusting to the heart's needs depending on what you're doing. High blood pressure is not high tension, as might have been suggested by the word hypertension. It's when blood pressure is persistently above the ideal. So how common is it and why does it matter? Well, it's actually the commonest identifiable chronic condition in Western societies and affects 25 to 30% of adults, over 50% of people over the age of 70. It's estimated that around 6 million Australians have hypertension. It matters because it causes strokes, heart attacks, kidney disease, and eye disease. Now, medications are effective at lowering blood pressure and reducing the risk of these diseases, but they are usually lifelong and often costly and cause side effects. So it's often of great importance and significance to a patient with hypertension if you are able to identify what's causing their hypertension and particularly if you can cure that cause and thereby relieve them of the burden of multiple lifelong medications. Primary aldosteronism is such a condition. The picture here shows a kidney in brown and the adrenal gland in yellow that sits on top of the kidney. We have a right and a left kidney, and hence we have a right and a left adrenal gland. In primary aldosteronism, there is excessive production of aldosterone, the salt-retaining hormone. If you make too much aldosterone, this leads to salt retention, which leads to hypertension. Also, aldosterone causes potassium excretion. And if this goes on for long enough and is severe enough, it can lead to a low plasma potassium level. Primary aldosteronism can be due either to an aldosterone producing adrenal tumor, like the yellow tumor you can see in this picture, in which case, usually only one gland is affected. It can also be caused by bilateral adrenal hyperplasia in which both the right and the left adrenal gland is affected. 
If only one gland is affected, primary aldosteronism is curable by removing the affected adrenal by unilateral adrenalectomy using keyhole surgery. If both adrenals are affected, then primary aldosteronism is specifically treatable with medications that block the effects of aldosterone. Primary aldosteronism was once thought to be rare, accounting for less than 1% of hypertension and not worth looking for unless you had a low plasma potassium. However, in the early 1980s, a Japanese group developed a better way of screening for primary aldosteronism called the plasma aldosterone renin ratio. This is much more sensitive at detecting primary aldosteronism than using plasma potassium because in this condition, aldosterone goes up, renin goes down, and so the ratio goes up, up. In Brisbane, we began using the primary, the plasma aldosterone renin ratio in the 1980s. And at first we mainly applied it to patients with low plasma potassium shown in this graph as the red bars. Even in the 1980s, you can start to see a rise in the detection rate of patients with primary aldosteronism per year. However, it wasn't until 1991 when Professor Gordon introduced the policy to screen all hypertension patients by plasma aldo-renin ratio testing, and not just those with low potassium, that we really saw a logarithmic increase in detection rate from about five to nine cases a year to 50 to 90. Now, the great majority of these patients had normal plasma potassium shown in green and therefore masqueraded as if they had plain run-of-the-mill ordinary hypertension and not primary aldosteronism. And these patients would have been missed if we'd relied on plasma potassium to detect them. As it turns out, only 21% of patients that we now detect as having primary aldosteronism have low potassium levels. We now know that around 10% of our hypertension patient referrals have primary aldosteronism, not less than 1%, a full 10%. We now have well over 2,000 patients diagnosed in our centre alone, and so far, over 400 aldosterone-producing tumours have been removed. Specific surgical or medical treatment leads to cure or at least marked improvement in hypertension, improved cardiac and renal function, and often a, 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 a dramatic improvement in quality of life. We think the latter might partly be due to the fact that they're coming off a lot of medications that may have been making them feel unwell, but also probably because aldosterone has effects on the brain and other parts of the body that make you feel unwell. Because of these findings, we were privileged to be a part of the authorship in the very first international guidelines for the case detection, diagnosis and treatment of patients with primary aldosteronism. And these were first uh, uh, published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism in 2008. So far, these guidelines alone have had well over a thousand citations. Since our initial reports on the high prevalence of primary aldosteronism, many other countries have similarly reported high prevalence rates of at least five to 15% amongst their patients with hypertension. And just as we have found, the great majority of these patients have had normal plasma potassium levels. Since we received the uh, Irene Patricia Hunt bequests, we have been able to do a lot of ongoing research studies in primary aldosteronism at our centre. Uh, a lot of this has been focused on improving the diagnosis at all stages of the diagnostic workup. One aspect of this is determining the effects of antihypertensive medications and other drugs and physiological factors such as gender on the aldosterone ratio. Now, this is very important because if you don't take these factors into account, you may be misled by the results of an aldo-renin ratio. For example, a number of antihypertensives such as ACE inhibitors and diuretics lower the ratio and cause false negative tests. So you might miss the diagnosis of primary aldosteronism if you test patients while they're still on these medications. We've been able to tell doctors which medications don't affect the ratio and therefore are safe to use when you're trying to do a diagnostic workup and which other ones you should avoid in order not to cause false positives or negatives. This has made the ratio far more meaningful and informative and improved the accuracy of detection of primary aldosteronism. In the top right corner, you'll see a very fancy looking machine 
This is mass spectrometry, probably the most accurate way that's clinically available of measuring aldosterone. One of our PhD students developed a highly accurate assay for measuring aldosterone using this machine. Prior to that, we were forced to use the much less reliable immunoassays, which can produce very misleading results. As you can see from the graph below the machine, when Paul measured the aldosterone levels using his machine and compared them to the gold standard method, the reference method used in Germany, his levels were almost identical at every point on the reference range. Now we're very privileged in Brisbane because we have mass spectrometry as the routine method of measuring aldosterone on all clinical samples uh, on patients who are managed through the Queensland Health System. This puts us in a very unique position in that almost all other centres around the world are forced to use the old fashioned, less reliable immunoassay. We've also developed more streamlined and less costly methods of confirming the diagnosis of primary aldosteronism in patients who have a high aldorinin ratio. The picture you see there is of a lady uh, sitting down and having an intravenous infusion of saline two litres over four hours. A normal person during this infusion will show uh, aldosterone levels that fall to very low levels, as you would expect, because we don't need a salt retaining hormone if we're loaded with salt. The old fashioned way of uh, confirming the diagnosis at Green Slopes and PA hospitals was a five day oral salt loading test, as opposed to a four hour intravenous infusion test. The old fashioned five day test meant five days as an inpatient in hospital was very cumbersome, time consuming and expensive. The seated saline suppression test is almost as reliable and yet can be completed as an outpatient procedure in four hours. Compared to the old fashioned five day test, the saline uh, suppression test uh, it, it, it is associated with a cost saving of $2,500 per patient or $75,000 per annum at Princess Alexandra Hospital alone. In the version one of the clinical guidelines I told you about before, we had not yet developed the seated saline suppression test, but by the time version two came out in 2015, we had only just published on it. Um, it was uh, seen to be so uh, promising that it was flagged in these guidelines. If larger studies confirm these findings, seated saline suppression tests may represent a reliable and more practical alternative to the five-day oral inpatient test. Now, since those guidelines were published, I'm very happy to report that the, we did complete a very large study which demonstrated the validity and reliability of the seated saline suppression test to the point where the great majority of units uh, that uh, attempt to diagnose primary aldosteronism around Australia are now doing this by way of a seated saline suppression test. And furthermore, that this test is becoming more and more popular in countries around the world, including in Europe. We've also been interested in understanding causes and consequences of primary aldosteronism, thereby hoping to improve treatment. Uh, for example, we've been exploring the mechanisms by which tiny genetic mutations recently discovered within aldosterone producing tumors lead to the development of these tumors and cause primary aldosteronism. By doing this, we may be able to develop new treatment methods directed at those mutations uh, to either prevent or treat primary aldosteronism. We've also been involved with elucidating genetic factors responsible for primary aldosteronism, including a familial form first described by our center, familial hyperaldosteronism type two, and you can see the family tree of our biggest family there. Uh, and in collaboration with a gene uh, German genetic group, uh, only very recently we've been shown uh, that this is caused by mutations in a chloride channel gene and we were able to publish these findings in the lofty nature genetics. Now, this is fascinating because chloride channels were never known to be involved with aldosterone synthesis, let alone to be involved with um, causing primary aldosteronism. So this is new pathology, new physiology. We now know that we need chloride channels to be able to make enough aldosterone for our bodies. We've also been examining how aldo excess affects the heart kidneys and brain independently of just putting up blood pressure, how it causes obstructive sleep apnea. And we think this happens because 
The aldosteronism causes salt and water retention, which leads to swelling of the tissues at the back of the throat. And why salt in, appears to be important in these processes. The graph you see there is from a French group, uh, Milliers and uh, co-workers. It shows patients with primary aldosteronism in the pink bars and those with ordinary hypertension in the blue bars. And as you can see, patients with primary aldosteronism, even though they had similar blood pressure levels, had a much higher rate of stroke, heart attack, and atrial fibrillation than those with ordinary hypertension, suggesting that aldosterone causes harm, not just by putting up blood pressure, but also by uh, directly injuring these uh, uh, tissues. So here is the old uh, um, uh, thought process that aldosterone causes target organ damage because it puts up blood pressure. But now we know that aldosterone directly causes target organ deterioration. And through work at our group uh, and other groups, we know that salt is important in this process. So if you have high aldosterone, but a low salt diet, you get less target organ damage than if you have the combination of aldosterone and a high salt diet, dangerous bedfellows. The Irene Hunt bequest has uh, made an enormous impact on our uh, publication metrics. Since we received the bequest in 2000, we published over 150 peer-reviewed scientific papers. As you can see here by the arrow, uh, over, our papers were cited by other authors in their own publications over 1,000 times in the year 2020 alone. So Irene Hunt has really helped to put us on the international map in terms of aldosterone research. These are just some of the medical and research achievements which were aided by the Irene Patricia Hunt bequest. Enhanced awareness around the world that primary aldo was a common, potentially curable and specifically treatable cause of hypertension. The demonstration that too much aldosterone causes heart and kidney damage and that its specific treatment, adrenalectomy or aldosterone blocking drugs, prevents and reverses this. We've been able to develop better ways of detecting patients with PA, better ways of proving they have PA, and better ways of determining if they have the unilateral form that can be cured by adrenalectomy. We've helped in the discovery of a new gene that causes primary aldosterism in families and in the understanding of the role of genes in causing non-familial PA. So Mrs. Hunt, we are humbled by your generosity in all kindness and grateful for entrusting us as the guardians of your legacy. Your gift is transformational. It empowers discovery, creates and innovates, and ultimately changes the world for good. You've helped us, you've helped the university, you've helped the research world, and most importantly, you've helped thousands of patients achieve a better quality of life through your contribution. Thank you.